Technology is a big part of what we're discussing today. So is sustainability though. And sustainability is an increasingly pressing issue for all our clients around the world. But it's developing at different speeds in, in different countries. One country where we've seen an accelerating speed of addressing this issue uh, is certainly uh, New Zealand. Um, and with me here to discuss an aspect of that today is uh, Blake Holgate, uh, livestock and sustainability analyst from New Zealand, based in Dunedin and here with us live streaming at Cockatoo Island this morning. Welcome, Blake. Thanks, Tim. Great to be here. Blake, one of the, the pointy ends of the interface between rising government uh, regulation uh, in New Zealand around sustainability and agriculture is, of course, livestock. Um, can you start us at the broadest level a a as to how livestock uh, generates emissions, bearing in mind that a lot of our audience aren't livestock producers? Yeah, sure thing, Tim. Well, fundamentally, there's three greenhouse gases globally we look at. So there's carbon dioxide, uh, there's methane and nitrous oxide. So carbon dioxide, that's our burnings of fossil fuel, uh, transport, energy processes. That isn't an agricultural gas at all. Yeah. So no connection to livestock farming with that gas. Yeah. The other two, methane uh, and nitrous oxide, there are. So yeah. methane is a product of ruminant animals as they process feed, uh, predominantly as they burp out, they produce yeah. methane. Yep. Now methane is a, is a very potent greenhouse gas but it only stays in the atmosphere for a, a relatively short period of time. Yep. Um, so sort of 10, 20 years, uh, and it gets continually recycled. Noxious oxide is the process of either animal urine, dung, yep. or artificial fertilizer, uh, microbes in the soil, as they process it, goes up into the air uh, as, a, as a greenhouse gas. Uh, a potent gas that does stay in the atmosphere for a much longer time, over a century, um, so moving forward, it's important that we can don't add to that anymore. Yep. So in the case of New Zealand, uh, where do these gases come from in your economy? Yeah, so those last two gas gases, those agricultural ones, methane, nitrous oxide, mm -hmm. make up around 49% of our total greenhouse gas emissions, with the carbon dioxide around 43%. Yep. Now that's quite unique in a, in a developed industrial world. It's the highest... Uh, in the, in the Western world? Yep, and that's coming from ag. 49% of the emissions on those gases are from agriculture. From agriculture. Yep. And, and that's due to the prominence of agriculture in the New Zealand economy. Yep. Uh, it's, a, it's our biggest um, economic earner. Yep. Uh, but on top of that, we already produce a significant volume of renewable energy. So around 80% yep. of our energy already comes from renewable sources. Yep. Um, so that means the total footprint of ag gases uh, is much higher. Yep. Okay, and, and that's really important to understanding uh, the New Zealand government's position on, on ag, uh, isn't it? Many countries have, have, have re committed to significant emission reductions as we move out to, to 2030 and beyond under the Paris Accord. But most of them are fa focused on the energy sector or, or the manufacturing sector and in some ways are giving ag a, a, a free pass uh, because they're recognising it's harder to measure, uh, it's food production after all, um, and concentrating on other sectors. Uh, but New Zealand can't meet its targets without addressing ag, can it Blake? So that becomes really one of the downsides to this whole concept of having nationally based emissions targets. It doesn't matter if the world values New Zealand's emissions more because we're producing high quality proteins uh, in, in dairy or, or, or red meat, uh, it's still a gas. New Zealand itself has committed to reduce it um, and, and hence ag has to be in there. Yeah, you're correct. We can't meet our international obligations without tackling the ag issue. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, we've already sort of tackled some of our energy gas issues um, through the renewables. Yeah. But to meet our Paris Agreement requirements, so we have to reduce our, our total greenhouse gas emissions yeah. by 30%, yeah. uh, by, based on 2005, by 2030. Um, yeah. Without tackling ag, it's going to be very difficult to get there. Yeah. And while at, at national level, um, New Zealand is, is the one country really bringing uh, ag uh, into an emissions type scheme, which we're going to, we're going to talk about. Um, there are pockets of the world at state level in the US and other industries that are working to reduce emissions, aren't they? So New Zealand won't be the only one um, 
trying to make progress in, in this regard. Yeah, that's correct, Tim. There's, there's pockets around the globe that are attacking it in different ways, yep. but it would be a, a misinformation to interpret that New Zealand's the only one that's attempting to do anything in this space, because yep. uh, that's just not true. As, yep. as you said, there's some, some key states in America, and particularly in Europe, uh, are looking very hard around what actions they can take to reduce their on-farm emissions. Yep. Okay. So let's, um, let's bury down at least to uh, individual farm level or at least uh, the, the types of, of ag production in New Zealand. Uh, what does the, the emission um, footprint look like in different systems in New Zealand at the moment? Yeah, look, you've always got to be very careful because there's a broad range of, uh, even within uh, certain farming systems, different intensity levels will have different impacts. Yeah. If you look at an average, on, on an average New Zealand dairy farm, they'll admit around 10 to 11 uh, uh, tons. tons of yep. greenhouse gas yep. per hectare, yep. uh, where sheep and beef operation will be around the three to five tons per hectare. Yep. But again, keeping in mind that's an average, so there's a broad spectrum in there, um, depending on the intensity of the top or, and type of operation being run. Yep, and, and that's not constant, is it? How, how has uh, emissions? How have emissions in New Zealand agriculture changed over the, the last sort of 20 to 30 years? Yeah, if you look at New Zealand emissions from 1990 uh, to now, yep. we've actually made some significant gains in the efficiency of our greenhouse gas emissions yep. footprint. Yep. Uh, so basically we're producing uh, more food at a, a more efficient rate of, of greenhouse gas production. Yep. However, despite that, uh, because we're producing more, particularly milk, um, our overall greenhouse gas footprint from ag has gone yep. up 16% yep. in that time period. Yep. Um, if you look at a sector like the sheep and beef sector, that's actually, in absolute terms, declined by 30% since 1990 yep. uh, because of both the efficiency gains, yep. gained through uh, better feed, genetics, uh, reproductive gains, yep. um, as well as less, less stock on the ground. Yep. And that, uh, that increased production of valuable food for the world, and, and in many cases, very high quality uh, nutrition uh, per unit of emission is, is something important to recognise and, and celebrate. Uh, but the actual targets New Zealand facing are hard numbers, aren't they? They're not adjusted by unit of food or unit of quality protein produced, unfortunately. What, what actually are the targets that New Zealand has committed to? Yeah, that's correct, Tim. So, so we mentioned earlier, under the Paris Agreement, a 30% reduction in, uh, in our, our 2005 levels by yeah. 2030. On top of that, the government's currently consulting a, a bill called the Zero Carbon Bill. Yep. Um, which will set hard binding legislative targets to New Zealand continually drop their, drop their rate of emissions uh, yep. going forward. Yep. Um, that's currently going through the parliamentary process yep. um, to give a better understanding of, of what that will look like going forward. Yep. And that creates a challenging situation, doesn't it? Potentially big changes coming down the line. Uh, but as you say, it's the, the legislation is still going through Parliament. Um, when will New Zealand farmers really have better visibility on, on what, what the future looks like to help with their investment decisions? Yeah, well, back in May last year, the government set up what was called the Interim Climate Change Committee. And, and that committee was tasked with advising the government and gathering evidence if agriculture was brought into the New Zealand emissions trading scheme, yep. what would that look like? Yep. That report's due to be released uh, late April, so yep. at that point we'll have a bit more clarity around some of the key questions. And those, when I talk about key questions, I'm talking about at what level will the obligation kick in? Will it be yep. through the processor? Will it be at a farm level? Yep. How are we going to measure it? Yep. Um, what, are the, what are the mechanisms to, uh, to require farmers to achieve these targets? Yep. So with that in mind, uh, our clients in New Zealand, farmers and investors in general, uh, largely can't just sit there and wait uh, and do nothing till, till this legislation rolls through. What are you suggesting that, that New Zealand farmers do to, to prepare for, for what is coming down the track? Yeah, look, I think we're at the stage now where it, it is challenging to do those on-farm practices to make a difference. Yep. So it's about engaging and building an understanding. And I think there's two respects farmers can do that. One is, well, what are the, the tools or practices we have available now? Um, so we've already touched on efficiency gains. So yep. through efficiency gains, they may be able to produce the same amount of food with less stock, therefore yep. reducing their footprint. Uh, there's some, there are some feeds now you can add that will make a marginal difference. Um, fertiliser use, how we uh, apply fertiliser. 
Uh, longer term, we're probably looking to more uh, science to give us inhibitors or, or vaccines. Yep. Not there yet, but potentially on the horizon. Yep. So I think that's one respect we engage in upskill. Yep. Uh, the second is engaging in the political process, the legislative process. The framework that is being set now, or, or will be set over the coming years, will define how we are able to farm in the future. Yep. So it's really important we get it right now, get that framework right now. Yep. Okay. Um, and Blake, we've, we've addressed this, or, or you've addressed this in our, our other forum, the concept of how, how we try and monetize uh, this increased greenness. So as we started off our discussion, New Zealand is now moving quite fast in, in this direction of looking for increased sustainability. Uh, it will be the first country, probably, to bring uh, livestock un under emissions uh, trading scheme. Uh, the, the, the challenge of that is there are going to be increased costs associated with that. Uh, but is there an opportunity here to, to, to have some first mover advantage uh, that the industry can capitalise on uh, around increased greenness in, in the marketplace? Look, I think there is, Tim. I do think it's a challenge. We have uh, shown in the past that, that individual uh, environmental aspects are hard to monetise in the market. Mm -hmm. I think where it's important for New Zealanders, we've got a really strong provenance story. Yep. And that is around being clean and green, a healthy source of food. Yep. Uh, and I think being a first mover in the greenhouse space will add some really strong credence to, and, and underpin that brand. And I think that's where maybe we can leverage it in, in the bigger New Zealand ag picture. Um, if we can demonstrate you know, our actions that we are taking and how that's making a tangible difference. Yep. And we've talked before also about the importance of finding the pockets of consumers who care most about these attributes to maximise our ability uh, to, to, to make a return, or, or at very least cover the costs of these uh, additional regulations. Um, and, and that really plays into the, in a way, the global marketplace story, doesn't it, Blake, in terms of um, the, the, the China story? Uh, the growth there, but do they value sustainability? And can New Zealand unlock good market access to Europe and Britain following Brexit? Yeah, correct, Tom. And it's about not just understanding the markets, but the consumers in those markets. Yep. So who are the consumers or the segments of the markets that we're targeting, and how does that align with how we're producing food and the food we are producing? And then how can we communicate to them, this is how we produce food, which differentiates us from other producers uh, they may be looking at consuming from. Yeah, because one of the, the attributes of the Chinese market we've discussed with our New Zealand client base before, um, and the position of New Zealand is, that the reality is New Zealand's largest market at about 23% of all exports in ag, and its biggest growth market is China. Uh, unfortunately in China, not all consumers uh, value uh, the greenness at point of origin as much as consumers in a market like Europe or the US might. And we've cited before the example uh, of palm oil, where markets like Europe and the US actually now, today, are, are largely uh, filled with sustainable certified palm oil. In China, that is a product that is barely bought into the country. Um, so New Zealand's uh, challenge will be, as it gets increasingly green, uh, to find the pockets of, of Chinese consumers that no doubt care about uh, greenness at, at the point of origin, or the multinationals who have global policies that care about greenness, uh, and or to open up other markets like Europe, the UK further, w where they will pay more for that. Do, do you think New Zealand um, will succeed in that venture, Blake? Yeah, look, I think we do. We've got all the elements there. Um, I think the bit is going to be pulling them together and aligning them. So we, so we are doing some, some good environmental sustainable stuff on farm. Um, we do have those consumers and there's markets out there that, uh, that want those attributes. Yeah. It's how we connect them and, and how we streamline it for farmers, how we align our, our, our local regulations with what our, uh, those, those food retail or food service providers are asking for, what the consumers are asking for. Yep. So how can we have consistency through that whole story? Yep. Uh, and I think that's going to be the key to unlocking that value, Tom. Yep. OK. And Blake, uh, as a research team, and your role particularly in that, uh, what, what should clients be looking out for from us uh, as the year develops, this legislation's become clearer, and, and what, what um, insights we'll be looking to deliver on that? Yeah, so th there's two main reports I'm going to be producing, Tim. Yep. Uh, one is an afforestation report I'm releasing in mid-April, uh, yep. looking at changes, government changes, how that's impacted 
uh, the incentives around forestry yep. and opportunities for landowners there. And then later in the year, I'm, I'm doing a more holistic piece looking at, uh, with all these environmental changes and other changes happening, what does that mean for the future landscape of New Zealand farming? What does that mean yeah. for our, our, our land use? Are some sectors going to get bigger? Are some sectors going to shrink? What are the long-term flow-on effects? Yeah. Uh, and on top of that, we'll be having, again, regular podcasts uh, where we can sort of give those more nimble updates as policy uh, is released and we do have greater clarity. Yeah. Okay, well, I think there's one thing we can say uh, about New Zealand agriculture in general, Blake, in this context, and that is there is no country in the world whose agricultural system has done a better job of navigating challenges uh, over its history. First, losing access to the UK market when it joined the EU, then cutting its teeth uh, and becoming a thriving, prosperous industry in, in, in a global market full of protectionism and subsidies for others. Um, it, it, it's flexible, it's professional, it's innovative. And I think there's every chance that New Zealand agriculture will navigate this challenge as well and, and come out in good shape. Yeah, and I'm sure they will, Tim. I think for me it's a question of are we going to survive these changes or are we going to thrive out of these changes? Yep. Yep. And that's, that's going to be the key bit to watch, I think, going forward. Yep. All righty. Excellent. Blake, thanks very much for joining us on live stream here this morning. Um, look forward to seeing you out there on, on, on main stage. Are you looking forward to anything in particular in the main forum today, Blake? Uh, yeah, nothing in particular. I know I've got my, uh, my colleague Emma Higgins is going to be on stage later yep. in the day, so yep. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing, uh, hearing her. Um, yep. And I'm going to get a wee, a wee snippet now or maybe a preview of what she might be talking about. You are, absolutely. Thanks, Thanks Blake. Thank you very much, Tim.